Next, let's read in chapter, John chapter 17, verse 6 through 19. You may rise as you are able. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and your glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may become one, they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and that world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, and they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, if you would join me in a word of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be accepting and pleasing in your sight this day. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, today, as we know, is Mother's Day. Uh, but today also happens to be what is called Ascension Sunday. Does anyone know what Ascension Sunday is? When Jesus was with his disciples and he went up to the mount and he ascended to be with God Almighty. He went home to be with his Lord. And so I was thinking about that uh, today because... Um, Part of what I didn't consider was how those disciples must have felt. Here, they had seen Jesus not only die on a cross, they had witnessed him be raised, they had walked with him in ministry for about a month and a half, and then he's gone. He goes home. Think about that moment when Jesus ascends, and if it is as, as the, the stereotypical uh, kind of image is, Jesus goes up into the clouds, the clouds close, and the light turns off, right? And they're still standing there on that mount. What must they have felt being there at that moment? I think that it probably was not only do they recognize how awesome Christ is, but also that they felt very alone and again, a second time. Next week, we're going to be uh, celebrating Pentecost. Pentecost is this day when Christ promised to send an advocate to walk alongside the people, is finally realized in the Holy Spirit descending upon the people and indwelling in them. That same Holy Spirit that indwells within you, that makes a temple within you, not a literal temple, of course, but that same Spirit that walks alongside you and helps you in your faith walk, in your faith journey, that's the same Spirit that came upon those people at Pentecost. And so I was thinking about uh, these people who have, these disciples, and these, these followers, and these apostles of Jesus who have experienced not only so many wonderful and amazing things, but I've also experienced that tension of loss by following Christ. How often does it feel like our walk feels much the same way? We come together and we sing songs of praise and it's easy for us to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
But then we may go out in the world and we feel like Christ isn't around. Or we question where God is. And so uh, today I offered us uh, two readings. The first one is from Psalm uh, 1, and then the second is obviously from John 17. Uh, the John 17 passage is a prayer. It's a prayer that Jesus offered, not for himself, but on behalf of all of his followers, his disciples. It's offered at the point in the narrative before Jesus is to be put on the cross. But I think that it would still be just as appropriate in this moment when Jesus ascends and we don't have the Holy Spirit with us yet. There is still that feeling of loss. And Jesus offers this prayer because he knows that this world is not right. And that there will be moments where we feel, as the believer, that we are being attacked by those evil forces, those wicked actions of the world, whether it be from other humans or whether it be from Satan himself. It's easy to feel lost in a broken world. And so Jesus offers us this prayer that we may not be alone. I paired this with this uh, passage from Psalm 1. Because in Psalm 1 it speaks specifically to how this world ultimately operates. You have some who are the wicked and some who are attempting to be the righteous. And so here in this space, we obviously believe that we are attempting to be the righteous. Which I would agree with. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The thing that's so interesting about Christ compared to other faiths, even though we as Christians, half of our good book is shared literally with our Jewish brothers and sisters. There's major differences between us and them. And even though our Islamic brothers and sisters believe that Jesus is the highest prophet above all prophets, there's still a difference between us and them. And the difference for us is what Christ is already doing in the world and how Christ works in our life. Christ works, as Paul says, to transform us by that renewing of our mind. To help us see where the world is broken and help us see how we can help to fix it. And Jesus gives us the simple answer to how we do that. He gives us two rules. Because this book is chock full of a lot of rules, isn't it? And it's hard to follow all the rules. And so Jesus, when he was here in his ministry, simplified it for us. And he gave us two rules. The first being to love the Lord your God, and the second being to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the crux of Christ's ministry is about love. When we read in Psalm 1 about the people who are wicked, it doesn't mean that they're evil. Rather, it means that they are those who don't understand or haven't gotten it yet. They are those who haven't seen the power of Christ and how Christ can work in their life and what Christ, in turn, can do through them in the world. Our calling as Christians is to make this world a better place. Our calling as Christians is to be that city on a hill, that light that shines in the world, that destroys all darkness, all evil. 
to stand together because we know how amazing our God is. And how amazing is God? How amazing is God? When Jesus offers this prayer, he offers it because he wants us to have joy and life abundant. The joy by which Jesus speaks of today is that abundant life that we as people who follow him have been called to. Don't we all want to live abundant life? Life anew? Life that is different from all the rest of the messiness in our world, the brokenness of our world. We're witness so often to those moments of life, whether it be through our life or through the lives of other with others within our church, of how difficult this life can be. Whether it's from broken families, or whether it's from people being nasty to each other at the store, or whether it's from people that just don't simply say hello or show kindness and compassion to others. Next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating Pentecost, and this is the day in which, as I said, we celebrate this coming of the Holy Spirit. It's the seventh Sunday after Easter, and it commemorates that the Holy Spirit came down, descended down, was sent by Christ, was sent by God to be with us, to be our advocate, to be our helper, and to help lead us towards this abundant life. It's the beginning of the church in those early days. That church, that Catholic church, which means not the Roman Catholic church as we know it today, but that universal church that wants to share love <coughs> with each other. The words which we read today and we study together today are actually a prayer from Jesus. It's his desired will for the church, that they don't fall victim to the things that we see in Psalm 1, to the wicked ways of the world, to the things that, that we know are wrong, but rather that we embrace, as it says later in Psalm 1, the righteousness of the Lord, which is to love God and love our neighbor. As Jesus prays, he affirms the truth of his words and actions as he walked alongside them, claiming a unique authority in his relationship with God. Words of comfort for the disciples for whom the moment of confrontation was drawing near. They knew that they were about to lose something. And Jesus is asking God, to protect them, to love them and care for them in this moment. Jesus' prayer is his final prayer with them before they head out to the Kidron Valley to meet with Judas. Jesus appeals to God for the sake of his disciples whom he declares were never his, but a gift from God, just as you all are a gift to each other. As the community of faith, you are one another's gift. To be with each other in those difficult moments of life. And to support and care for one another where you are. The mystery of God's choosing lies beyond our understanding, but the context and the direction of the choosing of the disciples is clear. To share in this ministry that Jesus has brought into the world. A ministry that was not meant to harm the world, but to transform the world into complete and total love. The fulfillment of what Christ desired. <clears throat> Despite the looming specter of his betrayal, the disciples can hear the hope and promise of Jesus' prayer when he says, I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Jesus came to give us life abundant, which means that even in the midst of brokenness, we can still praise Him. 
and have joy because of what he did on our behalf. I want to share a, a video with you all quickly. I saw this earlier this week. It's a, 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 news, um, a news story that, that uh, I saw come across Facebook, and, and it shows to me exactly why Jesus said that the best way for us to be, or the best way for us to approach him, rather, is to come with the heart of a child. Because so often when we think of children, we think that they don't, they don't know much of anything. But what I have found, it's been time, especially with these kids up here, and really throughout my whole time in, in preparing for, for pastoral ministry and, and being in my internship when I was in seminary, serving in another appointment and then coming here too, the thing that keeps coming back to me when Jesus talks about coming to him with the heart of a child is because children aren't warped by the brokenness of this world. They haven't had enough time to learn to embrace the wrong things. And because as, as Methodists we believe that Jesus' grace and mercy is with each and every one of us because it's God's love that is with each and every one of us, they know right from wrong inherently. And so I want to share this video with you today that only reaffirms this for me. Steve Hartman, and what everyone can learn from a four-year-old. He's faster than a speeding stroller, more adorable than a wet kitten, and able to get a stranger's attention with a single courtesy. Excuse me? This is America's latest superhero. Don't forget to show love. And the only superhero with the power to feed the homeless. Now, why do you do that? You know what, Mr. Steve? It's just the right thing to do. Is it? Yes. You want money? By day, Austin P. Ryan is a mild-mannered four-year-old from Birmingham, Alabama. But about once a week, he turns into this alter ego. Would you like a sandwich? A superhero set on feeding as many homeless people as possible. Thank you. What's your superhero name? President Austin. Mm -hmm. President Austin. <laughs> President Austin. President Austin. That's his idea of what the president is supposed to do. I'm like, buddy, you have no idea. <laughs> but hey, I'm going along with it. TJ says this all began when they were watching a TV show about pandas. It showed a mama panda abandoning a baby. TJ told his son the cub was now homeless. He says, well, what's homeless? I said, well, it's when you don't have a home and sometimes you don't have mom and dad around. I can tell what the follow-up question's going to be. Yeah, are people homeless? When I was a four-year-old, I didn't care about helping people. I did. I see. <laughs> Once Austin learned some people are homeless, and some are even hungry, he launched this caped crusade, told his mom and dad that he wanted all his allowance and money they would spend on toys <laughs> to go toward chicken sandwiches instead. How about you, baby? You're welcome. Don't forget to show up. After he gives out each sandwich, yes. he gives each person that same bit of advice. Don't forget to show up. Don't forget to show love, he tells them. And most do, immediately. Well, thank you. Everyone's no hard to see. We don't want you. We have a dream about Raymond Boss says this kid gives him hope. That's, that's, that's the way it starts. Don't forget to show love. Everyone who meets Austin leaves with hope. Which is why, with any luck, someday President Austin won't be a superhero anymore. Being a host is the highlight of my life. He'll just be a president. All right, come on. Steve Hartman, on the road, in Birmingham, Alabama. Fantastic. Austin will be eligible to run for president in the 2052 election. <laughs> <laughs> this is CBS Evening News for this week, but CBS News will be streaming all weekend on... <laughs> I love that little kid. I think he's awesome. And and when when we see in Psalm 1 that it talks about the wickedness versus the righteousness, and it says that the wickedness is just those who don't get it, he gets it. It's simple. As, as adults, we tend to complicate the world. But it doesn't have to be that way. We could just start with something small 
like when he did it with this little kid of Austin, this four-year-old did it. I thought it was amazing when I watched this. The first couple of times I didn't catch it, but the, the third time I caught it, I realized, uh, or recognized that they said that he gave up all of his allowance and all the money his parents would spend on buying toys to buy chicken sandwiches for other people. What a remarkable thing for a four-year-old to do. I, I find that shocking, and it only affirms to me what I've been believing for a long time, that if us adults want to figure out how to make the world a better place or how to make life better for everyone, we should just listen to the kids, because they seem to get it better than us most of the time. They really understand. Uh, Steph and I, uh, a couple months ago, got to go down for, um, I just want to gloat on one of our kids for a second here. We got to go down to Scranton, and there was a, um, a grandma and her, and her kid from this church who had started uh, this, this work to, to raise awareness about cancer. And they put all these flags out. Uh, down in that, that little square in the center. I guess that's where the city hall is. Is that what that is? Or courthouse. See, I don't know these things. That's okay. This is why I have all of you to help me along the way. And, and we went down, and, and this little girl from our church, um, who's amazing, took Steph and I over and explained to us all the things that, all the why they're there, what they're doing, and and what they are intending to, to help uh, with this work that they have been doing together. Uh, and they had us, uh, she, she gave us a, a marker and had us write um, on those, these little flags that they put out uh, names of people that, um, in our family, that died of cancer. And it was very touching to me because <laughs> that, that little girl from our church gets it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's okay. That's what I, you know, that's the world that we're here to build. People that, that, that get it. That get that this is a complicated thing. We're here to, as Austin said, show love. We're here to go and show love. Our kids get that. Better than most of us as adults. And, and they teach me every single day how to be better at being not just a pastor, but a human being, being a person in this world. In John's Gospel, at the end of our passage today, the writer says that Jesus' prayer instructs us that we are to be sent into the world. We are to be sent into the world to do what Austin said, to show love. If we want to bring the world together and bring our community together, that's what we're called to do. A.W. Tozer in the pursuit of God asks this question, has it ever occurred to you that when 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to that other standard. That other standard for us is Jesus. So 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking away towards Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could have possibly been were they to turn their eyes away from God in order to strive closer in fellowship. Yes! We're coming together so that we can look, not to me. I don't want you to look to me. I want you to look to the guy that's behind me, that's speaking through me. So that we can all be in tune together. Christ is the tuner by which we are to be in alignment. And friends, uh, I just want to offer a prayer uh, for you all today uh, as I uh, close out my sermon. Uh, one, uh, Jared has another church to go to, so we want to make sure that he can get on that. And uh, um, we give him thanks for sitting here a few minutes after his, 
he had to run, uh, but I also want to offer this prayer to you all because I think that it's important for us to remember that the life and the mission that we are called to is love. To share that love with others. So let us pray. Gracious and holy Lord, as we continue to, to, to look towards you, Lord, and to, to, to seek you, that we would allow for you to change our hearts, to transform us, to tune us to your will, that we may be one together in one ministry, one mission, to love each other, to love our neighbors, to love this world and all who are in it, because you made them in your image, to be loved and to love. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.